four, three. Forget that as a countdown. Two, Damn. One. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Ariel, you're vibing to your own music because I don't hear the music anywhere. <laughs> Welcome to the Underground QA podcast, a podcast about quality assurance in the video game industry. My name is Ariel Smith, I and mean, my pronouns are she, her, and I am a test discipline manager with Bungie. I have two fellow QA professionals joining us today, and I'll let them introduce themselves. Hey, everyone. I'm Marcin Japrowski, and I'm test software project manager at Ubisoft. And my pronouns are he, him. Hello, everyone. My name is David Benefield. My pronouns are he, him, and I am a QA lead at Obsidian Entertainment. Welcome, both of you. Um, so quick disclaimer, all individuals appearing on the podcast are not doing so as official representatives of their respective companies, and the opinions expressed here are exclusively their own. So... Last time uh, on the podcast, we discussed uh, certifications, test certifications, certifications of all kinds. What are they good for? Why should anyone bother get bother getting certificate, certified? Uh, and we also talked a bit about what is the ISDQB. Uh, the reason why this is relevant is the ISDQB recently came out with a new game testing syllabus and certification for game testers. And so we wanted to talk a bit about it. Um, we gave some of our... Uh, you know, initial first impressions, talked about some other certifications, some responses that the, the community responses to the new certification. Um, and what we're going to talk about today is we're really going to dive into more specifics of dissecting the game testing syllabus. So the past few months, we've been hosting a book club within our community where we have gone through the syllabus chapter by chapter. And we are, you know, talking about the things that we like, the things that we don't like. And in general, we found that uh, the community consensus seems to be that the uh, game, t the ISDQB's game testing syllabus has fallen down in, in a couple of big ways. So um, we've broken some of those criticisms down into six big categories, and we're going to go through each of them um, uh, one by one and talk about a few examples of those uh, criticisms as, as we've identified. Um, and to be clear, like we are, we are just expressing our own perspective on on it. We're not saying that the uh, syllabus is entirely without value, and in fact, we're going to talk about some of the things that we do like about the syllabus. But um, you know, we're primarily here to go through our criticisms to talk about how the ISDQB could make this syllabus better. Um, so. The first place that we want to start start off at is uh, David is actually ISDQB certified, so uh, we're going to ask him to tell us a little bit about his certification, what he's uh, gotten out of it, and like what he uh, basically what positive aspects of having that certification and getting that getting that certification he's found um, before we start to dip into our critique of the game testing syllabus. Awesome. Uh yeah, so I, uh, while everybody else was enjoying their winter breaks, uh, our company takes uh, some extra time off in December. I was like, you know what? I should finally go do that foundation level certification. So uh, again, to be clear, there's a foundation level, uh, which is what I took. I studied in December, passed in January, uh, became officially foundation level certified. Uh, the one we're going to be talking about is the game tester cert, which requires the foundation level cert. Um, so big takeaways from the foundation. Uh, I really liked kind of a standardized vocabulary. I think my biggest one was just being able to call out what is a an error, a defect, and a failure, and what are the differences between those three instead of just, well, a bug leads to a bug leads to a bug. Uh, so there's a lot of vocabulary there, uh, just defining basics like functional versus non-functional testing uh, that I felt just really good. I was like, okay, this is gonna be our, our industry standard. Uh, I will point out though that the foundation level is designed as a software testing, not a game testing. Um, so there were certain things in there that felt very uh, mismatched when applied to gaming. Uh, so, uh, I think the biggest takeaway is compared to some medical software that the patient dies if there's a bug or your banking software where everybody loses their money if you have a bug. Uh, if we have a bug in a video game, player is unhappy for a second and then they move on. So um, the, the bar that we're testing to is very different from a lot of that cert. Um, so a few things felt mismatched, um, but that was fine. I read it with the understanding going in that, okay, my application of this information will be different. Um, but it just covered a lot of basics. I felt the basics were really, really nice. Um, some, uh, 
some of the very basic terms were uh, like boundary boundary testing, um, and I really liked their descriptions of like black box testing versus white box testing, how static testing kind of is and is isn't always white box testing. Uh, so yeah, it, it just it had a lot of takeaways for me, and I I went into that cert expecting about twenty percent of it to be practically useful to me, and I got about forty percent. I was very pleasantly surprised uh, to the point that I yeah. took that all back to my crew uh, in January and said, "All right, team, let's look at this stuff." Um, and, and we actually did a little powwow, so not a full like cert, but I was like, "Hey, we should start using these terms and these ideas," uh, and it, and it was very beneficial for not just myself but for my whole team. So I went into the game tester cert going, all right, finally, we got something that's aimed at us. It's going to be keyed into what's uh, practical and useful for us. Uh, and it was very 40 clear. 40% useful, right? Yeah, I was, yeah I, was, I was waiting for that. I mean, over 40%. It's got to be more useful than the foundation level. Uh, uh, I think one other quick disclaimer, though, is that the foundation level has been around for years. One of our book club members mentioned that they've been working on this and iterating on this, and it's had many revisions, many patches, if you will. Uh, and we are looking at the raw first approved game tester cert uh, that's going out. So, yeah, bit, bit of I think it's like just literally version 1.0.1. So very, very, very early version here. I want to expand um, what they've, David said that. I, I haven't, I didn't do the certification. So I'm not certified, but I look at the syllabus and everything that it brings it. And also the agile foundation part. Uh, I, I have the similar experience. Like it gave me the, the vocabulary and it like structured the whole knowledge. So then I, I could, you know, do a proper training for, for juniors about the test, uh, testing knowledge and, and having like a proper discussion and put things into naming for when talking to dev other devs. Um, and there are some things in the agile when we were switching from, from waterfall to, to a more agile approach, there were a lot of good, uh, approaches and, and proposing like they weren't like, this is the only approach. Like you can have testers inside an agile team. You can have in both, you can have outside and those are pros and cons. So it was very, again, that 30% of usefulness to mm -hmm. game testing world when you, um, structures your knowledge, gives you proper vocabulary. Now you can have uh, a proper uh, vocabulary to discuss with other people. It was super great. And as David, and I think as everybody else that, that had experience with the, um, the game tester, it's not the same, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, and one other thing I want to call out that's, that's, you know, important to remember is that there's a difference in when it comes to the ISDQB in terms of the syllabus itself, the courses that you take regarding the syllabus to prepare for the certification, and then the certification process itself. So there's actually like three distinct parts here, and a lot of those parts are handled and managed by different groups. So the people who actually write the syllabus are not the people running the courses, and they're not the people running the actual certification tests. So it's possible that one part of this three-part uh, process could fall down in a significant way, but the other parts could still contain a lot more value in them. Like maybe it's possible that the um, the actual like certification courses where they teach this stuff is providing a lot more context and maybe even correcting some aspects of the syllabus that they think are incorrect. It's pretty helpful. But uh, it, that's that's my most hopeful way. But like at the same time, they wouldn't be contradicting it because their goal is to prepare you for the certification test which is based on the syllabus right yeah. so we're here we're not here to judge the course or the test we're exclusively focused on the syllabus that is used being used to, to to generate the other two um so that's important just context to bear in mind as we go forward with our criticism um so okay, so our first criticism that we want to talk about of the of this syllabus is that in general we found that the quality of writing was actually pretty poor. Um, so it felt like you know, uh, let, let, and let's go, let's let's actually get into some examples. So did, David, was there anything in, in as far as the quality of writing that you wanted to call out, um, and and what made you feel like it it fell short? All right, I'm gonna steal a big one because this one radiated with radiated with me the most uh the, the falling through the floor uh versus clipping so there's a section where it goes into great detail about describing this event where a character can fall through the geometry 
uh, and their, their bodies can collide with it in a way. And it's a very practical thing that everyone knows about. And I'm sitting here reading this paragraph, just going, what are you talking about? And by the time I got to the end, I'm like, you're talking about clipping, a character clipping into, uh, it's called clipping. Uh, and, and like reading through this doc, I, I even like control left later for like, is this called clipping or did they say it's also called clip? No. Uh, and we learned from our book club uh, that this is probably just a translation issue is that in Russian, it more directly translates to falling through the floor, but an idiomatic translation would be into clipping when you express it in English. Uh, so there's there's a lot of that expressed throughout this doc that, uh, and I know we'll talk about roles, but I feel like other things are just, it probably was fine in Russian. And when it got translated, it wasn't translated in a beneficial way, um, which I, I don't want to harp on too much, but if I have a candidate who's interviewing for a QA position, and they start talking to me about this falling through the floor type issue. And I'm like, that's wrong. <laughs> it's not the right term. <laughs> uh, and so I, I, I feel that some of these issues would be detrimental to the uh, potential candidates that are applying for my company. Be like you, you've been misinformed. Uh, and again, it, it'd be yeah. a simple cleanup. Yeah, no, I, I think that like because that this uh, syllabus was written in, in, in Russian first um, and then translated, there were a lot of things that got lost in translation. Um, and, you know, I, 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 I agree, like I think that they should have done a, a some kind of like pass on it to make sure that the language after it got translated, like they didn't, I, I don't know how exactly they translate it, but hopefully they didn't just run it through Google Translate. But there should have been some kind of pass done after that to say, let's now go through and make sure that we're actually using the correct terminology that game testers who test in English would utilize. Um, and yeah, that also uh, felt missing for me. Maybe um, if they read their own chapter on localization testing. I was going to say it. <laughs> Uh, got him. Um, <laughs> what about you, Martin? Was there anything else that, that came up for you as far as the quality of writing? I'm, I'm going to steal another big one. That is some definitions felt like they were aiming to be technically correct as opposed to useful. There's a perfect example about t 2D graphics. And I will literally just read how it's in the syllabus. 2D computer graphics are classified according to the type of presentation of graphic information and image processing algorithms that follow from it. Usually, 2D computer graphics are divided into vectors and rasters, although there is also a fractal type of image representation. And that's it. On, on, the, on, the, um, on the chapter on uh, testing art in games, that's the definition of 2D graphics. Nothing about, you know, the different art styles. You know, you have, um, the, you know, you have the, the pixel art stuff. You have the old 8-bit stuff. You have... Um, that's 2D, 3D, I don't know, uh, two, two and a half D, right? Like when you use sprites mm -hmm. and merge them together to have that. And, and sometimes even um, use t 2D in 3D uh, engines and games. Nothing about that is just like a very technical, like you cannot argue like that's 2D graphics, but it has zero usefulness to anyone. And I wouldn't even expect to, to someone that is, again, for example, going back to the interview stuff, like if I asked to, to, to mention any um, what do they know about 2D graphics and they will just build out this definition, I would be like, okay, cool, but, but what about games? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, in, in, in general, I felt like in a, another, one of the big things that really kind of pointed to the quality of writing for me was it, you really felt the different voices of the writers throughout this document, like each chapter felt like it was written by an entirely different person. And my <laughs> suspicion is that it probably was um, because they, I think that what they did is they probably got different experts on those areas. Like they got like a graphics tester and then an audio tester and then a localization tester. And each of those testers wrote the chapter. And because of that, there's a real lack in consistency in terms of, um, you know, how, how long each section is, how much detail they go into with regard to the different subsections. Um, there's like some chapters that are like 30 pages and other chapters that are like four. And so it's just, it just like, it, it, it feels wildly inconsistently, in, in, inconsistent chapter from chapter and some kind of like general like voice and style pass uh, on it, I think would have would have helped. Or maybe if they had a bit more 
you know direction in, in terms of like you know how they should write write the chapters because it felt a bit like each writer was writing it from a completely like like without a, a kind of shared set of standards essentially or a shared or shared style shared voice um and then i i my guess is that was only exacerbated by the translation um because like we didn't then they didn't then do a post translation style pass or or shared voice pass or anything like that um And then on top of that, there was just a lot of errors. There were a lot of like, <laughs> or defects rather. I'm sorry. Uh, there are a lot of like grammatical uh, like uh, issues, incomplete sentences, things there's, were sometimes there's a lot of formatting too. Like uh, some of their tables yeah. were clearly bullet points before, and then got converted to a table, but didn't actually remove the bullet points or remove periods. It was it was very inconsistent. Capitalization was inconsistent. Um, yeah, it, it there was, kind of feels like there was one sentence. I, I cannot find it, but there was like um, uh, there was basically a sentence that basically ends on a on a on a colon and has bullet points, and those bullet points have anything nothing to do with the sentence that previously saw it. Lists. It's not a list. It's just it's just not a sentence. But it seems like somebody just put a random list for no reason. So there's a lot of issues like that. Yeah. And that there are there are like other times where like they would they would say something and I would just I would read it and I would be like I don't even understand what is trying to be communicated here, and and again I I think a lot of this comes down to you know stuff getting lost in translation which is totally understandable but I do think that they that 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 it really needed a heftier uh, post translation like. Uh, editing pass on it essentially so i hope yeah. they, i hope they do that and then that's something that i think that is very likely to come come out in like a version two of this syllabus is they'll probably do some kind of like larger editing pass um so hopefully this is just this is all just because it's just the the rough first draft and we're just seeing it at its most raw and, and we'll we'll get there eventually or something early access yeah this is the early, early access, access version. <laughs> version of the the, the syllabus um <laughs> okay um so let's move on to our, our next criticism i think we already touched on this a little bit um but our second criticism of the syllabus is that some sections felt wholly incorrect wrong or unhelpful um who wants to go first oh you know you want to talk about the tables ariel <laughs> Uh, yeah. Okay. So we we have to talk about the tables. We like this is the, <laughs> this is the thing that came up in almost every single chapter. In almost every single chapter, there was a like a table of roles, essentially, of all the different roles on a development team, uh, with regard to that specific category of testing. Um, in every single book club session we had, where we talked about one of these tables, it was. There was, there was a lot of heated criticism of them because it, 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 it in many cases seemed to be missing important roles or um, the definitions were 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 off. We'll say. Um, do you have any specific examples of, of the tables that you want to talk about, David? Oh man, I'm scrolling through them right now. I I know that there not only were there some that were off, there were some that invented roles that I've never heard of. I'm like, oh, I'd love to meet the person who's devoted to keeping all of my documentation up to date all the time. That doesn't exist. I think that was the the analyst in chapter one. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, no, I, 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 I wonder if like if maybe that role does exist in like certain the, Russian yeah. studios or something like that, right? Like, yeah, the de the definition is identifies product re requirements. Works with the original specification, updates specifications, keeps them up to date. I uh, there's no role for this at my studio. Like I I have never met a person that does this particular job, and this is the only thing that they they do. It's generally like either the designer who wrote the design spec is updating the documentation, or the tester who wrote their test spec is updating their documentation. But there's no, I've I've never met someone whose sole job is maintaining documentation like this yeah. i think it's an interesting idea but 
Like it, it's it, it just felt to me like I I've, I've never worked at a studio where this was a thing. So it seemed it seemed odd. Like the inclusion of it seemed odd. For me, so the shining I've... example is that there's like a, a features of the graphic content of the game product. They mention artist, 3D modeler, texture artist, animation specialist, and technical artist. And that's one table. And when they are discussing, uh, so they basically did the, the work to to mention each title, even though it is not a comprehensive list. It's at least some of a list, and it's not, you know, they basically say 3D artist does 3D, 2D artist does 2D. Um, but then in the uh, level design, when they're like, who's responsible for testing, they just say game game level designer, artist, and a tester, and then they just bunch up. All, all art forums into one. Um, and I just mentioned that uh, level design should be correct from texture, lighting, and other visual perspective. So which, which artist, like you named six artists previously, <laughs> which artist will be doing that? There's no, so why this inconsistency? And one in one table, you explicitly define artists and the other one, you just like some artist is doing the testing. Yeah, and like like ch charitably, like I, f I feel like they're they, you know, it might make sense to say something like you know, well, we're just talking about the specific roles within this context. Like you might have a job title that is different than the role you're taking within this particular context. So you know, an art an artist might be a character artist or an environment artist, but within this context of this table, they would just be an artist. Like that that again is the most charitable interpretation there. But like I think what you're pointing at is that there is a real inconsistency to how they approach these roles tables. And it it, it makes them come across as as very odd in, in, in some cases. Um and then there are other times where it just it just seemed wrong. Like the in the the chapter for graphics testing, the description of the technical artist was performs technical testing, mm -hmm. and that's just not what a technical artist does, as far as I know. Like like every technical artist I've done has has you know been more focused on things like creating tools for the artists to use yeah. or working on the technology of the game that the artists are utilizing, not te doing technical testing. Like technical artists aren't testers. They're not a part of the QA department. Right. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think that these, these, these roles tables need to be like carefully reexamined, potentially even removed honestly, Cause I think that they're, they're, they're more more confusing than not. Um, I, to their credit, one of one of the paragraphs before one of the tables did mention uh, that we're about to list some roles, um, and basically had some sort of vocabulary in there that at a larger organization these might be specific roles, but at smaller organizations people might do multiple jobs or bleed over. And I feel like that would be that should have just been at the top of any of these tables, and then just make them consistent yeah. with each other. So you can say you could even say like artist, there will be subcategories of artists defined in chapter X, which is what they would do in the foundation level uh, uh, syllabus is that everything said, please see chapter X for, you know, more definitions of these things. So yeah, I, I feel yeah. like there's some strong improvements they can make that wouldn't even be all that difficult to do. Yeah. I mean, going back to the, the previous criticism of the, the quality of writing being poor, like I think that it does not that the document does not seem aware of itself in some spaces is how it the, the 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 writing can feel poor at times because like there are things that are repeated through multiple chapters or discussed in multiple chapters and sometimes it refers back to the previous instance like sometimes it says go look back at chapter 3 where we talked about this in more detail and then other times it doesn't do that when it probably should mm -hmm. um and that that like lack of consistency is you know noticeable like it it, it feels yeah. like wait why why aren't they you know referring you back to the same document where they already talked about they, this? they've already established something with their foundation level of this is how we write syllabi and then they don't use that same methodology for this syllabus it's just strange yeah Histro historical <laughs> accuracy, like you could you could see somebody was very excited about historical accuracy because it's being repeated all over the place. And I'm like, mm -hmm. why do you even, I mean, it's important for some games and in some aspects, it's super important to do that. And it's cool that they did that. 
but so much emphasis on historical accuracy and even distinction between i think they, they use like accuracy and some other word like um that uh, it's worth when, when it's accurate to the to the events and everything because maybe it's a historical game but then accurate in terms of like physics or whatever else so you don't have to be accurate towards people or events but you have to be accurate towards the period you're working in and i'm like why so much time devoted to some very <laughs> niche aspect of, of of gaming and repeat yeah. it in every like not in every chapter but in many chapters was every time it was men and i'm like why uh it's because war thunder uh i don't know <laughs> like uh um, honor yeah yeah it's well i mean yeah i i and i think that that's that is kind of one of the 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 other like problems is that like there's there's a lack of consistency in in terms of what should be a chapter versus what should be a subsection versus what should not be included at all. Like, there are entire swaths of categories of testing that we could be talking about regarding game testing that seem to be absent from this this document. And um, that actually did, gets into one of our other criticisms that we're going to talk about in a little bit. Um, but, yeah, like I think there is like a pretty significant inconsistency in terms of when they decide to go in-depth on a particular topic versus when they decide to just talk about it at a very high level. And I think that that points back to the thing that we've talked about as far as there being multiple writers. This was not written yeah. by a single person with a single consistent perspective. Um, and there, you know, it, it, it seems to be lacking a like pass to make it consistency or like a set of guidelines and standards that would make it more consistent because all of the writers would be adhering to those standards. Um, and I feel like there should have been a a bigger outline written for the syllabus as a whole, and then the writers should have gone in and, and, and like yeah. yeah, like a large a large structure that kind of breaks down not just the seven chapters, but what the contents of each of those seven chapters were going to be, and then the writers could go in and, and write them and out. In. And yeah. instead, it felt like they like these are the seven big categories you person who is writing this category put whatever you want in there and so that created then a lack of consistency in terms of mm -hmm. the amount of depth within each of the chapters that that's my suspicion but like again like i was not involved in writing this so i don't actually know how they went about it it just comes across that way because of the lack of consistency yeah there seems a lack of direction in the whole document right like there's there's so many good stuff in there that that, that you read that and it's like a good section, but there's a lot of stuff where it's either, as you said, like misplaced or out of order or for no reason or too much. Like they should, they should be like a syllabus director having a vision of how, from how to approach, right? Because one of the things that is for me missing um, is that triple A indie and anything in between because mm -hmm. indie testing is completely different from triple A. Like for example, oh, yeah. the table is the biggest example of that. You've mentioned yeah. that in the indie studios, because it's like 20 people, um, there won't be any specified roles. Like you'll basically have an artist that basically does um, UI and, and graphics and everything in between. You'll have a, basically a game developer that either does also gameplay and, and the programming as well. So it's going to be very multi-dimensional and multi, multi-professional. While you go into AAA when you have 200, 1,000 tens of thousands of people working on it. So now you can specialize. You can have a base of the game only all her time or their time into rigging. And that's that. Like you don't have to, it's no longer a 3D artist. Now it's a rigger that his only time is rigging models, right? So there's mm -hmm. there's no approach here. And it's basically depending on the chapter you're looking for. One chapter will be like, it's from an indie perspective or, um, or a very small studio perspective. In the other chapter, like, for example, in localization, it's super detailed about different aspects and localization and everything that a bigger studio or a publisher would take into consideration, but definitely not an indie studio that basically, you know, wants to put a game in English and that's that. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah. And I, I like some, some studios are literally a single person, right? Like yeah. Stardew Valley, for example, yeah. the first version of it was Vampire made entirely Survivors. all by one. Or what? Vampire, or Vampire Survivors. Survivors yeah. yeah. And like over time, more people have contributed to those, those games as they have like been ported to different platforms and you know like for vampire survivors i think there's even they've, they've had like guest writers write portions of the lore for it and stuff yeah. like that so um but like 
yeah, the, the the lack of consideration for the variance of how studios uh, work and approach things, yeah. I think, it, it, and it's kind of inherent to the problem of what the ISDQP is trying to do here. They're trying to say this is like the way that things are done, right? Mm -hmm. This is like the terminology. They're trying to set the like the bar essentially and say this is these are the words you're supposed to use. These are the roles that there are. And in order to be able to have a test where you can ask the questions, well, what are what are the, the ten roles of you know graphics testing, right? And and I think that like because it's written in a way that they're trying to create like definitive truths, they're trying to to, to, to speak definitive truths that they can then test you on later. Mm -hmm. That is, I think, undermining the actual content within because they have to make definitive statements where there's actually a lot of variables, where there's there's actually like a lot of uh, diversity in how different teams approach these and how what, what different roles look like and stuff like that. And what's interesting is the syllabus itself is inconsistent on recognizing this because some chapters will say, now, the different studios will approach this differently, and then other chapters won't say that. And and they'll they'll be more definitive. So it's 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 not only are they like sometimes neglecting to acknowledge the the diversity of game studios and game development in terms of you know size and and approach, um, but they're inconsistent about that recognition, which uh, comes across as odd. Um, so again, like I think that you know, going back to some kind of like style pass or something like that, where they go in and you know make it a little bit more consistent in terms of taking the time to recognize the diversity of different game studios and in terms of their again their, their size and approach, um, I think would be helpful, and it would also make the statements they're making more true because of the the context that they're adding in. Yeah. Um, So uh, let's move on to our next criticism, um, which is this feels like a dictionary that is trying to teach the vocabulary of game testing, but not the techniques of game testing. Um, who wants to start first? I have a, I have a perfect example mentioning the localization. Um, and it's and it's game free, meaning you have to use it and apply that knowledge. And then there's like a whole section about defining what is internationalization, which I don't think ever, like I even ask specifically because maybe my knowledge is not sufficient for, for localization testing if they ever use internationalization as a process. And the only answer to that was maybe in, on some more bigger triple A maybe, but by default, we, we go broad and then we localize into different markets of different languages. But they focused so much on defining what is internationalization and then went on about software testing and a game testing syllabus. Then I was like, okay, why I'm even like I'm in game testing part. Why, why are you talking about so much about the software and difference? Like it's not even like differences. It was basically telling you how internationalization is being done in software development. And it's like a whole page. So there's a yes. lot of a lot of moments. This, this the example that we gave about the 2D graphics. Like this is basically like doesn't give you any useful information. It's just defining what's 2D graphics without any context to game and how does it apply. So yeah. those are like two examples. And there are many more. Like we could probably do like three hours of of <laughs> yeah. every yeah, every but... possible definition of how it basically does the dictionary stuff and focus so much on definitions and defining things and not putting into useful uh, applicable context and perspective where you're like, okay, how can I apply internationalization into games? There's nothing about it. It's just defined it, remember it, I guess. And that's that. Like, it doesn't give you any value. No, nothing how you can apply to any process or anything. It's just mention it for, for the sake of mentioning, like a dictionary would. Like, this is yeah. very unhelpful. If, if, if they were going to talk about the techniques, they would say something like, this is 2D graphics, uh, you know, and they would talk about vectors and rasters the way they do. And then they would say, and the reason why that matters is blah, right? And the, what you should know about that is blah. Or how you test, then use that to inform the creation of your test 
plan for a 2D graphics game is blah. But that's the part that, that feels like it's often missing throughout the document, is they, they define the terms and then they don't really go into the techniques. And yeah. and I think that, like, you know, talking more about, like, what David originally talked about in terms of the value he got out of the foundation level was having those those those, those defined terms, mm -hmm. like, uh, that... That maybe isn't something that the ISDQB syllabus, like, is trying to do, but I feel like they should. Like, I feel like that, that that's the part that's most interesting, is the actual techniques of testing that, that are coming out of these definitions. Um, you know, like, why, why teach someone about uh, how, like, bug clusters and how bugs tend to cluster together unless that is then going to, you know, inform how they approach um, uh, testing, right? Um, and, like, I think to an extent, you know, just by learning the definition, a Spark person might be able to abstract the value for themselves and then say, like, oh, well, knowing that that's the case, knowing that it's made that way, I'm going to test things differently. So it's not like entirely valueless to talk about the definitions and talk about these concepts, but it is a missed opportunity to not go into more detail. Yeah, I think um, as David mentioned in his how useful and also I mentioned like this gives you the vocabulary, but there was also the, the whole part about techniques and, and to name them and use them like the perfect two examples that are, um, that are, best suited for gaming from from the foundation level is the state transitioning the game is basically full of states like it's a a, a very complicated state machine especially mm -hmm. when, you, when we talk about quests and such like this is basically you have states and different and you have to follow them and move so even uh, i we talked b before the show with david that it doesn't necessarily we need to have it again repeated in the game syllabus but having like a then like hey this is a place where this technique would be super useful. Like go back to foundation and review it again in the context yeah. of gaming. And it'll be super useful. The same with the decision, decision table. Like there are end states with, uh, so you have like 10 endings in the game. Then you have to, and you cannot have time because multiple, like there's like 20, 30, 100 decisions to be made to end up like, I think in the given example in Witcher 3, there's like 36, no, I'm, I'm missing the, I'm misremembering. That's the the front breaker. Front breaker had 36 end states, and the decisions to be there is like goes into hundreds or even thousands. You cannot test everything. So what mm -hmm. do you do? You you apply the decision table technique, and you can outline the the min maxing, of, and you can use that from the foundation. And you could basically say, and there's a whole chapter about end, game states and and saves and everything. You could use that and basically say. This is where you can apply a functional, useful, valuable technique in order to do that. And there's nothing mentioned of that. It's just putting, like, I cannot, you, you don't go yeah. into gaming or any anything with just with a dictionary and learning how to do things with a dictionary. You have to have context and, and link those things together. And the dictionary won't provide that. And also the <laughs> syllabus as well. <laughs> it's like if um, med school only taught biology, right? They only taught you this is how the body works. These are all the different organs. These are how they interact with each other. But then they never taught you medicine. They never actually taught you about like surgery or prescription medication or anything along those lines. It was strictly like, here is all the parts of the body. Like that's what this syllabus feels like. Here are all the parts of game testing. Uh, you know, at least some of the parts of game testing. Um, but it 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 rarely dives into the actual medicine and the and the places where it does feel incomplete like every single chapter at the end of the chapter has this like brief like one some one page sometimes it's just like a single paragraph that talks about the tools of this kind of testing i think that the that subsection should be so much bigger in every single case because it's the most interest like i arguably could be the most interesting part of the whole thing is not just here's the biology of of here's the anatomy of game testing but here is how you approach it with testing here are the methodologies of actually testing it but they even um, over complicate stuff like they over complicate some definitions and even add like the fine things that are usually not using in the 
in any context like there's uh they define gameplay mechanics and non-gameplay mechanics which basically is gameplay mechanics is whenever because uh, even like it can even read you out the whole the whole thing gameplay mechanics relate to when the user consciously interacts with the gaming system basing their actions on the availability of information like it's why so official about the thing why not put it in more simple terms and you do it like a dictionary like very formal like making sure that everything fits to like a spectrum of language instead of being like practical and useful and then they go about no gameplay mechanics which is basically the opposite but again using a very over complicated official language and we never in game dev talk about we never name anything a non gameplay mechanic like no. usually it's if it's something to do with backend we just use you know backend processes or anything with backend or fronted like we name those things based on what they're doing we never refer to them a non gameplay mechanic so it yeah. even makes the not only it makes it uh, a very dictionary like definitions but also in some cases over complicated and they just invent dictionary stuff that does not exist in our world yeah um cool so before we move on to the next couple of criticisms that we have i want to just take a minute to respond to some of the questions that have come up in chat first question is do you plan to reach out to the iocqb board with this feedback thank you mike uh for that question um, we have actually already shared some of the feedback from the uh, book, book club sessions uh, with folks who have worked on the ISDQP, and then my understanding is that they have then gone and shared that with the people who need to hear it. So, um, yeah, a lot of this feedback is getting shared with them. We haven't like formally sent a letter to the ISDQP board or anything like that, but we are, you know, trying our best to make sure they hear it because we think that there's a lot of potential improvement to be made. Also. There are a lot of people who are involved in working on the IACQB who have feedback of their own, which they have also been sharing with the board. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think a lot of the criticism that 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 folks have about this document is is getting shared back with the board. We will see what they they do with it. My hope is that they they come out with a new improved version. Um, fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. Yeah. Um, let's see. Do, 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 do. And I think the other question was, do you feel like the game testing cert builds on the foundation? That actually directly leads into one of our next criticisms, which is the syllabus does not feel like it sufficiently utilizes or refers back to the original foundation level terms. Uh, David, do you want yeah. to dive into this one first? <laughs> I would love to. <laughs> uh, so again, one of my big takeaways from the foundation level was that vocabulary. So um, big ones for me were, again, uh, defining what an error versus a defect versus a failure was, uh, talking about boundary testing uh, and other testing types, talking about like functional testing versus non-functional testing, talking about static testing versus white box versus black box testing. And to their credit, some chapters, because again, we're pretty sure different authors were authoring different chapters, do bring up some of those terms but what I was expecting was to get to that section of, all right, we're in graphics testing. We talked about all the different types of graphics that are involved in games. Now here are practical applications of the foundation level terms and methodologies you learned in gaming. And that's just missing. And it's, it almost feels like they're writing the syllabus with one hand tied behind their back because they spent all that time defining it for the foundation level and they require you to have the foundation level certification before you're allowed to take this certification. So it should be there. It, 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 sh it should make this whole doc a lot easier for them to write, harder for someone to read. Uh, like it, I accept that it will be more difficult to just say, and here type to static testing. And if you don't know what static testing means, that's going to be a very difficult paragraph to understand. Um, but they do have their, their glossary and you can, you can search that stuff. Um, yeah, it's just, it's just missing everywhere. And I think that's, the biggest thing is I, I want them to reuse these things that they've forced me to learn before reading this doc. Uh, and, and that would go to Ariel's point of getting this more consistent. It's like, hey, uh, author X, who's going to talk about graphics, at the end, I want you to read these terms of black box testing and static testing. Just cut it there and tell me what can you test from a black box environment? What can you test from a static environment? Um, and I, I think that would just make this whole doc flow a lot better and, and be for those who have taken the foundation level cert and maybe reminded themselves of it in the last couple months, uh, be able to read the document better uh, is that we can get that, that consistency across chapters and just be more 
applicable. <laughs> I think that's my biggest thing is I, <laughs> I read so much of this and I'm like, how am I going to use that? Uh, but that's a, that's a different point. If, even trying to play devil's advocate, like let's say they don't want to copy any, like let's say the, the, the hand behind the back is not use anything from the foundation. This is an expansion. So you're banned from using anything from foundation to add new content, right? But okay. It makes it even more complicated because they, they define stages of game development, which instead of using a software cycle, which we use in industry, which is alpha, beta, gold, they used movie standard, which is pre-production, production, and post-production. Yeah. Like, of course, in some sense, sometimes people use pre-production, production, but it even can be hurtful. Like, you know, we use as a server environments, pre-production and production. So people, if they're yeah. here in, a, in the discussion there, they might get confused. So... This is a perfect example of how they don't build upon their previous foundation level. Like we not we are not using anything different from from software cycles. We we basically reuse them, and they instead of going back to it, like basically making a sentence, stages of gate development doesn't differ from software development cycle. Don't boom easy. They invented new stuff for no reason, and it just overcomplicates or even misleads people instead of being helpful and useful. Um, yeah, if I can give a caveat, uh, I, I will call it chapter five, because again, I think there's a different author for the game level testing did go out of their way to describe um, describe errors and defects and actually use the ISTQB terms. It, it felt to me like, oh, this person's done the cert. Um, so I, I feel like that is actually the closest thing we have to a rubric of they, they define here's the different types of things. And then here's the different types of you know defects to watch for uh, and ways to catch them um, so that I do want to give a caveat that there are pieces of this document that are hitting the marks I'm looking for. It's just not consistent. Yeah, I think it's worth repeating. Like it's, I think that's why it makes us all frustrated about it and emotional because it's not, it's not that the document, the, the syllabus is the worst, right? Like it has a lot of gold nuggets that are super useful, uh, provide context or things that I uh, usually uh, people that don't know anything about game dev forget or not think about like save game states and save games in general um scene lightning for example that people don't know that a scene uh, lightning artist exists and there are people dedicated to that so there are a lot of things that are details that people miss and it, and it does not exist in software testing it's super useful but then 80 percent of that or 60 percent of that is a lot of things that are either misleading or problematic or unhelpful and that, that makes it so frustrating because you can see that if given a little bit of love or a little bit direction, that would be a very awesome syllabus and a very awesome piece of, of knowledge and vocabulary creating for, for software testers that want to transition from software testing to game testing. So close and it's so frustrating. <laughs> um, yeah, there was one more question. Is it a case where they require you have to have some practical experience before taking the game testing cert and they just assume you should already know how it should be? So the expectation that the ISTQB has is that someone taking this uh, course already has one year of experience as a game tester and they have taken the foundation level uh, certification. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think that that, like, that that should inform how they approach writing this document and and part of how it falls down is it feels like at times they're trying to write for the person who has zero experience and no prior experience with the foundation level um and other times it feels like you know as david says they are referring back to the foundation level um so i like i i think that like a part of i think that having that year of experience is going to help people understand the portions of this that are right and uh, maybe not so relevant for their like particular space um, of, of the industry. Like if you've had a year of experience, you will recognize like, oh, well, that's not a thing at my company. Like, so I'm not going to take this, this part super seriously. But these things that they're, they're talking about concepts in terms that I recognize. So at least in those spaces, I, I, I will, you know, get, give more consideration. Um, but I like, because I think that I would worry about someone who approached this syllabus with zero prior experience, because I think it actually could potentially steer them wrong or teach them things that are yeah. incorrect or 
um, make them feel like they know terminology relevant to game testing when they actually don't, or they, they know the wrong terms, or um, and then they might walk into a studio feeling like, all right, I'm ready to go, and then we have to, you know, their their manager has to do a whole bunch of like work to essentially undo some of the like in- mislearnings effectively. From, but, but imagine a situation when you're a, a, an indie tester, like you come from a very small company and the guy goes like, or rather the person goes like, oh, this is how, you know, those bigger companies test and they do gamepad testing, like they do hardware testing and then, you know, they go prepared and everything. And then you're super confused where you're getting at, where, where, is, where this knowledge of a very niche that usually the third party companies use is coming from like you wouldn't be testing controllers in any capacity in, in even the biggest of companies. Yeah. Yeah. Well, as I mentioned earlier too, um, I'm I'm fearful that, that that person who would otherwise have a good experience walks into an interview armed with bad information and poorly represents themselves. Um, yeah. yeah. That that just feels terrible. That they went out of their way and they tried and they went to this cert maybe too early. It's like I really want to do everything I can to get a job. And then this actually decreases their chances of getting that job. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I think that like, you know, a little, little bit of interview advice for anyone who's potentially interviewing for a job soon. Um, you know, one thing to, to do when you're interviewing is to like actually make sure that you're speaking the same terminology as your interview. Don't interviewer, don't make assumptions that they are going to, be utilizing terms the way uh, you know you use them at a previous studio, or the way that you learned them from you know s- you know someone you know in the industry, or the way your um, game design course t- taught you. Like a- part of the problem with the game industry is that every studio talks about game testing a little bit differently, and every and a lot of studios you even use terminology that seems incorrect to someone coming in from a new space i like one of the funniest things that like c- comes up at a whole bunch of studios is the term regression mm-hmm. and what is bug regression <laughs> yeah. a lot of game studios will talk about bug regression as like oh yeah that's when you go in and verify that a bug has been correctly fixed but in software testing a bug regression is when a bug that was previously fixed resurfaces so Regression testing is uh, making sure that uh, you know bugs have not resurfaced, as opposed to what um, pe- people talk about in some studios as bug regression being making sure that a bug that was fixed has been correctly fixed, right? So that's a common term that is inconsistently used at a wide variety of game studios. And so if you walk into a interview saying, I know exactly what bug regression is, you might find that you kind of step in it a little bit just because you're using a term in the way that the um, interviewer might not. Um, yeah. And I think most, for, for what it's worth, most hiring managers are going to be aware of that particular example at the very <laughs> least and how it's inconsistent. Um, but like, it's something to be aware of is that just because you took a course or just because you... Um, you know, uh, took this certification or because you had a job previously at a game company does not mean that the company that you're interviewing at has the same understanding of terminology and the same glossary that you do. Mm-hmm. So when you talk about testing, it's important to kind of verify, like, uh, you know, define your terms as you're going yeah. through yeah. the conversation um, instead of making making assumptions. Yes. Um, okay. We have two more pieces of, of feedback that we're going to kind of jet through here uh, before we wrap up. Um, so the fifth piece of feedback we have is this uh, syllabus seems to be missing important sections or overemphasizing on less important aspects. Uh, I'm going to talk about one of my particular <laughs> uh, pieces of feedback as far as this goes, which is I think the game controller chapter is just extremely bizarre. I do not understand why they have this chapter here. Um, and and what, I, what, what, what feels wrong about it is it feels like they're trying to, to point at three different kinds of, of testing, and they talk about two of them very poorly, and they shouldn't talk about the third at all. because it's, So the first is that it feels like this chapter is talking about UX testing, 
It also is trying to talk about compliance testing, mm -hmm. and it is also trying to talk about hardware testing. It's four. It's like four pages long, and half of it is the hardware aspect of it. And I feel like the hardware testing portion should be entirely absent from this chapter because very few game studios do any kind of hardware testing whatsoever. It is is very rarely a part of their actual job. And compliance testing and UX testing are significant areas that deserve like a lot of focus, a lot more focus than this chapter was able to give them. Um, so like, I feel like this chapter should be dissolved and they should create two new chapters that are like UX testing and compliance testing, or maybe even better would be something like platform testing. And then you could kind of talk about UX testing and compliance testing within that, uh, that chapter, but that, that feels like that chapter is essentially mislabeled and then it was steered in an entirely wrong direction. And then because of that, they wound up having very little to say about it, which is why it's only four pages long. Which um, makes you that frustrated, right? Because when you think about gaming, <laughs> the whole difference between software and gaming is that you have so many types of controllers, right? You have guitars, yeah. you have Wiimotes, all that stuff, right? Like people even are connecting bananas to, to, to computers just to play games, right? So <laughs> it seems like super important to talk about controllers, but as you said, like it's somebody misunderstood what was the, the reason behind making that, that chapter and went yeah. completely off of the of the script. Yeah. Like game testers don't chest don't test the hardware themselves. They're testing the software utilizing that hardware. But that yeah. is that is UX testing. You're talking about how the user interfaces with the game. Um and so there's a lot of really interesting things to talk about there because like, you know, if you're looking at uh, playing a game like Fortnite, for example, Fortnite exists on a wide variety of platforms. It exists on the mobile uh, platform as well and playing it on your phone versus playing it on an Xbox versus playing it on your computer. Those are all going to be pretty different experiences in terms of how you actually interact with the game. And it also is like a pretty significant like difference in terms of how you approach testing the game because you're going to need to think about how the game is is uh, tested from all of those different uh, platforms. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, that's <laughs> well, that chapter really got under my skin. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but once even, the chapter but even started that, talking, even... go ahead. Oh, please go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. I was just, once the chapter started talking about fishing rods and train control panels, I'm like, this this doesn't belong. Like this, no. And I also thought like they had this giant list of just all these different inputs and, and stuff. They don't even list VR devices. I'm like, that's that's more applicable and exactly. common than a fishing rod, yeah. right? Uh, yeah. 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 That that whole section really had me scratching my head. But I think there are parts um, in some section, like in the I, I, I've read the the definition of the two D graphics is two sentences about two D graphics in era when um, you have Vampire Survivors, which is primarily two D, and then Cult of the Lamp, primarily two D, and you just devote two sentences to two D graphics. But then for scene lightning, you devote like a whole page, yeah, which is very three D, open worldy kind of mindset, right? So even in those yeah. things, it's like it's bizarre of, of your uh, space usage when, you know, 2D graphic is barely like any percent of your syllabus where scene lightning is a whole 1%. Yeah. I mean, I think that that's, that's the, the bias of the authors showing through, right? Yes. Like each of these authors has specific experiences with certain kinds of games. And so when they think of like, all right, well, how am I going to structure this chapter? They're going to reach into their experience to, to, steer you know sure. how they outline it and what they talk about and so if i'm a tester who's only ever worked on 3d games when i talk about graphics testing i'm probably going to talk about that from the perspective of, of a 3d game but gosh it would be great if they uh you know had uh people who worked on other kinds of games contribute to that chapter like i feel like you know if this was a more i don't know community driven uh document like if there were just a, a more diverse set of perspectives that were uh, uh, approaching it um before it got to this iteration like i think that a lot of these 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 pieces would have been better representative of 
the diversity of the the game industry right yeah. but because they're kind of starting from a handful of of perspectives they're they're kind of unaware of their bias to a certain extent they're just like unaware that they're like kind of excluding important 2d graphics testing uh concepts um which ironically in testing is super important to recognize your biases <laughs> because they yeah, make you blind to a lot of issues, right? So I, mm -hmm. I, th this uh, this syllabus is very ironic in how in the quality of it making towards the the statements and things that are inside of the of the syllabus itself. Um. All right. Well, let's uh let's move on to our final criticism of the syllabus, which is uh it feels like it's biting off more than it can chew by trying to cover all of game testing when that is actually a massive topic. Um, I talk too much, David or you, Ariel, because I'm... <laughs> yeah, I'll do that. Um, I don't think localization belongs here at all. Uh, I I think that there is so much that goes into localization testing, and it's I don't want to say it's unimportant, but it it occurs at a portion of the game. So like uh, the doc, I didn't even touch on not talking about vertical slices, but uh, through all your phases of, of game production, however you define them, uh, localization occurs during a small sliver of it. And I, I feel that localization testing could even be its own cert uh, where they go over specifics about it. So as far as biting off more than you can chew, like, just take it out of here, put it into its own cert, and let this document focus <laughs> on functional testing. Because, um, yeah, there's there's so much. And if you look at... Uh, one, one of the things that ISTQB does for their chapters is they tell you how long you should spend on each chapter for the courses. So for a certified course, you must spend 180 minutes in chapter two about testing game mechanics. And so if you look at things, they spend 75 minutes on chapter one, 180 on chapter two, 165 on chapter three, uh, 190 on chapter four, while only 65 Sound testing. for game testing levels. Yes, wow. Sound testing, gotta spend three hours in there. Game testing, that's just one hour. Um, but yeah. then they, they spend game, a good... Yeah, game level testing, right? Game level testing. Uh, yeah, yeah. And then you have to spend an hour, or two and a half hours on localization testing compared to the one hour you spent on game level testing. I'm like, no, it's just it's just too much. Just get it out of there. You, you've you written so much that you realize that this is important and, and is, has depth to it and complexity that's very unique as well. Like my, looking at it from the perspective of my... Uh, analysts and testers that I have in my studio right now, they don't need chapter seven. That is not impactful to their job because localization testing usually happens with a partner company. Uh, yeah. So it, yeah, it just feels, it feels out of place. And again, it just makes the document longer and harder to interpret. And like to, to be that person trying to decipher this document, you're, you really get into one section about game level and then totally different, <laughs> different ways written, different way of thinking to do localization testing. It's just, Talk too much. It's too much. It's too much. Just get it out. <laughs> no, I I think that like that that breakdown of time per chapter is very interesting to me because it really does like overemphasize on certain kinds of testing. But I think that if you worked at say a uh, external QA company or an outsourced QA co company, mm -hmm. this like breakdown might make a ton of sense to you because the kinds of testing that your company is being asked to might correspond to this breakdown. A pretty significant portion of the testing that outsourced companies handle is localization testing. So of course you would have a giant chapter dedicated to localization testing. Sure. Uh, but I think that what you're getting at is, is, is kind of my reaction too, which is there's a difference between talking about game testing as a general concept and you know, game testing uh, games, like generally speaking, how how they're made and how we approach testing them, versus all of the different specializations of game testing that fall within that. And like you say, like I think that some of those, like localization, are probably should be their own certification instead of trying to shoehorn them into this larger certification. Yeah. Instead, I think that this certification should try and focus more on concepts that are relevant for all game testers. Um, the thing that is interesting about that though, and is I think will, will, a challenge and why they didn't go in that direction is because 
that's kind of what the foundation level already does right like the foundation level already talks about things in a very kind of general way instead of talking about the specific uh specializations of of software testing they have other certification testing for that mm -hmm. so i think what my pitch to the iest could be would be here is instead of making a game testing certification that builds upon the foundation level uh, t uh certification make a new foundation make a new games foundation level test certification that covers a lot of the concepts in the original uh foundation level ISDQB, but as they explicitly uh are relevant to game testing because i think that there are things in that foundation level that feel wrong to a lot of game testers or feel inconsistent yeah. with their actual understanding of game testing and I think that having a game testing foundation level certification would be very useful for a lot of people who are trying to break into game testing for the first time and looking for a place to start instead of starting with the foundation level, which teaches them a lot of stuff that maybe they don't isn't relevant to what they're going to be doing or don't need to know. Um, they'll actually be able to, you know, jump, jump, jump right into stuff that is directly relevant to what they're doing. Um, and so I, that's that's kind of my 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 pitch of what what I think they they should do. Ariel, they they, you are, they are a step ahead of you. They already did that. But for an agile tester, agile <laughs> tester has exactly what you want. It's basically referring to the how it differentiates from the software and everything, and you know makes the examples. It's like full blown document about you know agile testing and making it all and it has its own route. Like it's, it has agile. Yeah. And then it goes into um, organizational and then technical. So it basically has its own thing. So they already did that. So they just do that again, but for games, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> um, yeah. So that's 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 my pitch. Um, anything else that we want to talk about this particular point, or should we move to our wrap up? It's just too much, too much to for for one just, for one syllabus. Just too darn much. Yep. Um. Yeah. Cool. All right. So before we go, let's do a quick lightning round. Everyone, uh, what's something positive that you have to say about the syllabus? What do you? What did it do that you like? I'll start. Uh, so I, I had three things. So one, uh, I liked in section three point two point one. They brought up a very simple concept, which is that. QA can't test everything. Uh, from the perspective of uh, environment art, QA doesn't know what's expected. So something, uh, a strategy QA should be doing is teaming up with those folks and asking them how these things work in some sort of joint session. And I was like, oh yeah, that's a great idea. Everybody should do that. And then I had to go self-evaluate and go, oh, I haven't been doing that. Let, let me go find a way I can do that more strongly. Uh, so I liked that. Again, I brought up earlier section 5.1, uh, went over errors and defects really well, showed a very good use of the foundation level showing up in this higher level cert. Um, and then just a small one, section 1.1.5 talks about the differences between testing a game and playing a game. And I was like, oh, thank you. Thank you. Yes, that needs to be somewhere early on. Because, um, yeah, I, I have so many people who aren't in the industry that are like, oh, you just play games all day, right? And I'm like, Man, I haven't touched my game in forever. I'm doing so many other things with the game. Uh, so I, I found all of this yeah. good little nuggets throughout. Yeah, there's a good section about multi-platform testing and pointing out that something that will may, may work on a PC might not work on a console, vice versa, and showing the importance of doing that testing. And I even you know suggest um, to have different approaches how to how to tackle that problem. It's a very good little chapter. Uh, which could be obviously its own chapter, but it's it's a very little small piece that is super super crucial. They have very good and extensive on save games as well. That was super cool, usually um, overlooked. And the biggest practical example of that on on one of the projects I worked, there was a memory leak in save game files, and they basically were bloated in like gigabytes of uh, of storage over time. Um, so. Yeah, every every like even if we said about localization, even though it, like it's it's unneeded here, 
it should be just mentioned and that's that. Like localization chapter, aside from some like this is this is the opposite. Like localization is 80 percent good, twenty percent bad. Like there's a lot of a lot of good stuff in there. Like you know, pointing out that there's you know some jokes, contexts, um, things that might not work in, in 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 for one market and not work for the other market, and how it why it's important to do so. So yeah, there's a lot of good nuggets spilled everywhere uh, that are super cool, and it's. It's just a shame there's no more more of that. Yeah, um, and I'll say two things. Uh, the first is I thought the the quality of the writing in the audio chapter um, was 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 good. Like it, 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 mm -hmm. honestly, like the, the the folks who who wrote that chapter, I, I felt like did did a, did a did a pretty solid job, and and I want to give them some credit. Um, I am not going to comment on the. <laughs> The, the content of it, but I do feel like the quality of writing for that chapter was was better than some of the other chapters. Um, and the other thing I want to say is I really appreciate what the ISCQB is attempting here. I I think that there is a lot of value in potentially having a uh, game testing certification because I think that will allow game testers to be seen more seriously as professionals, right? Because we have to get these professional certifications in order to do our jobs. Um, but in order to get there, we have to have a certification that we trust, that we feel like is is actually, uh, you know, ascribing uh, an expertise that we value. Um, and so I don't think we're quite there yet. I really want to see the IUSDQB continue to iterate on this syllabus. I would love to see them uh, collect some some feedback, uh, at, you know, like like this from the broader uh, game industry and then improve. And my hope for them is that is really not that they give up on this project, but that they continue to push forward and try and make a useful syllabus that um, is, you know, valuable to folks throughout the industry. Um, so IACQB, if you're listening, uh, you monolith you. No, I'm just kidding. But if you're, if anyone from the IACQB is listening, I, I really hope that you keep working on this, keep iterating, keep collecting feedback. Um, because I think that there there could be something here, but it just it's just not quite there yet for me. Um, all right. Copy, copy uh, the agile, move it to game, and then we when we're good. <laughs> there you go. I need to go look, look uh, at this agile one more. I haven't looked at that one yet. Yeah, it's really good. Like it's awesome. Like I I, I for my teams whenever I, for my current team and my my previous teams. I was pitching like the foundation level and agile foundation level as well. Like those are solid foundation. Uh, syllabus is this. those are really good cool so i'm just going to do a quick summary of what we talked about today today we talked about our criticism of the game testing icqb syllabus um where we felt like it fell down our six primary points uh, uh or six categories of feedback were that the quality of writing is poor some of the sections felt wholly wrong uh or uh incorrect or unhelpful it feels like a dictionary that is trying to teach vocabulary of game testing, but not necessarily the techniques of game testing. It seems to be missing important sections or overemphasizing on less important aspects. The syllabus does not feel like it sufficiently utilizes or refers back to the original foundation level terms. And it feels like it's biting off more than it can chew to try and cover all of game testing when it sh that's actually a massive topic and instead they should perhaps be more focused. Um, so that is our discussion for the day. Uh, let's go ahead and wrap up. Um, David, my understanding is that you have a bug of the cast that you would like to share with us. I do. Uh, so this one came up while we were working on Pillars of Eternity 2 Deadfire, uh, is we had a, a character in the game that we enjoyed a lot. It was a drunk pirate. Uh, we enjoyed it from the time we were writing it. And then once we got the voice actor in there and she gave a wonderful performance, it became kind of a, a crowd favorite and a dev favorite. They're like, this character is so good. So we decided that in one of our updates, we were going to make this a character you could recruit to your party. Uh, we call them sidekick characters. Uh, and we're like, yep, we're going to get Murta the Drunk Pirate in there. And she's going to have extra lines, get the voice actor back in to do some cool stuff, give a little storyline. And of course, we tested the heck out of it. We're like, yep, can you recruit her? Does she work in this way? Does she show up in these states? If you destroy everything in this, it's a game you could kill anybody. So. If you kill her, does she stay dead? Uh, we had to fix that bug. Uh, and we're like, okay, we got it. We're all set. Let's send out Merka. And uh, we let people know. It's like, hey, this is part of this DLC, the free DLC, I think. Uh, 
is that you can you can now recruit Mirko. And as soon as we launched, we started getting strange screenshots that Mirka is sitting there, beer in hand, in her idol, completely buck naked. And I don't mean that she's wearing like her, you know, any sort of robes at all. I mean completely naked. And we're like, wait, that's not how our game works. Uh, so it took us a little moment to kind of figure out what's going on. How did we miss it? Um, at the end, there is one spot in the game where only companions and the select NPCs can go that is a bathhouse. And that is where characters, it's an M-rated game, that is where characters are allowed to be naked. So only those characters actually have the capacity to become naked. Uh, and as we made her into a uh, possible companion, she gained that ability. And the reason it's snuck by a lot of our testing is that this only happens in the base game if you don't own the new DLC. So we had to update the base game and most of our tests were happened <laughs> with the DLC oh, active. Yeah. This bug only comes up with the DLC <laughs> inactive. Uh, so, yep, we, uh, we we totally launched a drunk, naked pirate into our game uh, and it, it we figured it out pretty quick and we fixed it pretty quick. But it was a moment of going, what? <laughs> how do you, how did that get out there? Um, yeah. It's my bug. Fantastic. Working as intended. Leave it. <laughs> I mean, who doesn't enjoy a drunk it's, naked it's pirate? It's totally true to her character, too. Like, the fact that she's a yeah. drunk pirate, she just exactly. it doesn't even recognize that she's... It, it played right into the exactly. character, so... Felt oddly One fix as intended. Easy. <laughs> oh, my God. That's great. Uh, all right. Um, before we head off into the sunset, uh, I'm going to give everyone a chance to plug things. Does anyone have anything they would like to plug? Go play Vampire Survivors and Cult of the Lamp. Very good yeah. games. Uh, God, I'm so addicted to Vampire Survivors. I own that on multiple platforms now. <laughs> yeah, I don't think it's so on good. your list, but Go or, do you want to plug your uh, your volunteer form? Oh, yes. Good call. Uh, so we are actually um, call, basically asking for uh, volunteers, for anyone who is interested in helping out with the um, community or the podcast. Um, let me go ahead and get a link together for that. Um, I also want to plug the Discord itself. I'll post that link in uh, Twitch chat here as well. Um, so if you're not already a member of our Discord, I highly recommend that you join it. Um, there's all sorts of cool folks in, that, in, in the Discord who are chatting about QA. We also have some great channels uh, for reaching out and getting some professional support if you're uh, trying to find a job and struggling, maybe head on over to our resume reviews channel and ask someone to take a look at your resume and give you some feedback on it. Alternatively, we also have a jobs board where people post jobs and you can take a look at those, see what uh, what jobs are out there that maybe you're unaware of. Um, there's all kinds of awesome resources in the Discord. I highly recommend if you're in an industry, you care about QA and you want to learn more about QA, head on over. If you just want to network and, and interact with other people, also head on over. There's all sorts of cool stuff happening in there. Um, similarly, uh, you know, as David said, we are looking for volunteers to help us uh, both run the community and run the podcast. We're always looking for more people to uh, reach out to us and about how they can uh, help either by appearing on the podcast as a guest or helping run uh, events in the community. Um, and so we just recently put out a uh, volunteer form where we're asking people who are interested in volunteering to help out with the, the, the community to fill out that form and let us know what you're interested in doing and uh, what your availability looks like so that we can either have you come on the podcast sometime or have you help out with managing the Discord. Um, Lastly, we also have merch. We have a merch page. Uh, merch. There are links to it on our social media page where you can buy sweet t-shirts like these or the poster and, and, and the mug <laughs> that you can see on Marching screen. Um, and uh, none of that is for profit. It all goes, uh, all of the profits go to the Trevor Project and Girls Who Code. Um, we just think that, you know, it's cool to represent the community and also want to help uh, a couple of great charities out. So uh, head on over to our merch store and uh, check out all the cool stuff there. Um, and the other thing is that uh, in terms of our social media presence, we're primarily moving over to using LinkedIn as our primary social media presence. So I recommend that if you are interested in following us on social media, that you follow us specifically on LinkedIn. And let me go ahead and grab the link to that, and I'll repost that as well. 
And boom, there we Do go. You mean we cannot trust cool. Twitter now? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we're still on Twitter. It's just we are exactly. we are a professionally oriented group, and I think that that makes LinkedIn a more appropriate venue for us in some <laughs> respects. Um, so that's it for today. Uh, I really want to thank David and Martin for joining me on the podcast today. We'd also like to thank our audience for listening. We wouldn't be able to do this podcast without you. I also want to th thank everyone who came to the book clubs that we've had for the ISDQB. We straight up borrowed and stole a lot of the feedback that they had um, to uh, put together our kind of categories of, of criticism for today. Um, and so if you're, if you're interested in... Um, you know, kind of helping the podcast without necessarily being on the podcast. Coming to those book clubs is a great uh, way to do that because we talk about awesome, uh, you know, interesting topics. And then when there's pieces in that, uh, those discussions that are relevant to our podcast, we rope them into the, the podcast itself. So um, if you have any suggestions for future topics or bugs of the day, we'd love to hear from you. If you are a QA professional and would like to be on the podcast, we'd also love to have you. Um, like I said, either you can fill out the volunteer form or you can contact us at undergroundgameqaconf at gmail.com. That's undergroundgameqaconf at gmail.com because we were originally a conference and not a podcast. Um, or you can reach out to us on Twitter at Underground. QA, um, or you can find us on LinkedIn. Um, thank you for joining us, everyone. Keep playing, keep testing, and as always, keep washing your hands. Thank you, guys. Thanks, up. Again, I don't hear any music. Oh, it's not even playing live. There we go. Yes. Yay, now <laughs> it is. Yeah. I was watching it here, Rock out. <laughs>